If that's the case, rather than me answering it verbally, I prefer to do it in a different way. Please read a two-page document that I wrote about that. Okay? So now you can have a copy as well, and you can give it as formally my answer. Start at the beginning. James is intelligent enough to cut and paste. <laughs> Maybe the best way to describe what I mean by a viable vision is by a quote taken from a letter I wrote to my friends in November 2002. When I do an analysis of a company, I am somewhat satisfied only when I clearly see how it is possible to bring the company to have, in less than four years, net profit equal to its current total sales. Knowing the response of most people to such a claim, my next sentence was, I also learned not to share this expectation with the top management. They will take it as a decisive indication that my suggested solution is unrealistic. During 2003, I put this to the test. I put to the test the reaction of top managers. Rather than keeping the vision to myself, I put it at center stage. Not just the vision, but mainly exposing the reasons for my conviction that that incredible vision is viable. I started by sharing the diagnostic of what is currently blocking the performance of the company. Based on that, I deduced using solid cause and effect logic, the tangible steps that are bound to remove that block. Then, I dived into detailing the steps that have to be taken in order to capitalize on that breakthrough, the steps that will propel the company to have, in less than four years, yearly net profit equal to its current yearly sales. Done in this way, the first reaction of top managers was, this is just common sense. Why haven't we done it before? Why haven't they done it before? OK, and from here starts the real answer to you. <clears throat> Why haven't they done it before? How come the prevailing notion is that unless the company has a unique product or unless the company is very small, it is unrealistic to expect a company to increase its net profit by so much? How come, even though it is possible to construct a viable vision for more than half the companies, the prevailing notion is that it's impossible? By the way, for you to notice, this was written a year ago, and here I'm saying 50%. Now I'm using 80%. Do you know what happened? more experience to know that we can do it in 80% like that. Go ahead. The answer is that most people are unaware of the fact that any complex system is based on inherent simplicity. Capitalizing on the inherent simplicity is what enables incredible improvements within a short time. So what is inherent simplicity? To explain this concept, we first have to clarify what we refer to as a complex system. The more data one has to provide in order to fully describe the system, the more complex the system is. If one can fully describe a system by four sentences, that's a simple system. But if one needs a thousand pages to describe it, that system is complex. So how complex is the system you are working for? How many pages are needed to describe every process on every part, the relationships with each client, et cetera? It's no revelation that companies, even small ones, are very complex. It is also no revelation that it is difficult to manage a complex system. So how do we go about managing a complex system? 
we dissect it into subsystems. And each subsystem is, by definition, less complex than the whole. If you have any hesitation accepting that this is precisely what we do, just look at your organization chart. But dissecting a system into subsystems has its price. It leads to missynchronization. It leads to harmful local optima. And in some cases, even to the devastating silo mentality. Since our systems are incredibly complex, it seems that all that we can do is just minimize the price to do the best we can to improve the synchronization and to foster better collaboration between the subsystems. And as long as this is the only option that we consider, we will be under the impression that achieving a significant jump in profit within a relatively short time is a rarity. We will be under the impression that bringing the company to have in less than four years net profit equal to current total sales is unrealistic. To see the true potential of a company, one has to delve deeper into the issue of complexity. What bothers most of us is the fact that part of the data that typifies our system does not relate to just one component of the system, but to the relationships between two or more components. In other words, the thing that makes our system difficult to manage is that what's done in one place has ramifications in other places. The cause and effect relationships turn our system into almost a maze. But that fact is what provides the key for the solution. Think about it the following way. Examine a given system and ask yourself, what is the minimum number of points one has to impact in order to impact the whole system? If the answer is 10 points, then this is a difficult system to manage. It has too many degrees of freedom. It's like attempting to manage a bunch of wild cats. But if the answer is one point, then this system has only one degree of freedom. It is an easy system to manage. Now, do you agree that the more interdependencies existing between the various components of the system, the less degrees of freedom the system has? Considering the enormous complexity of your system, it follows that there must be only very few elements that govern the entire system. In other words, the more complex the system is, the more profound is its inherent simplicity. To capitalize on the inherent simplicity, we must be able to identify those few elements that govern the system. Additionally, if we are also fully aware of the cause and effect relationships between these elements and all other elements of the system, then we can manage the system to achieve a much higher level of performance. These few elements, the ones dictating the level of performance of the system, are the constraints of the system. This implies that the constraints are also the leverage points of the system. Hence, the name I chose for this approach the theory of constraints, TOC. The process to capitalize on the inherent simplicity is straightforward. One, identify the system's constraint. Two, decide how to exploit the system's constraint. Three, subordinate everything else to the above decision. Four, elevate the system's constraint. And five, if in the previous steps a constraint has been broken, Go back to step one. It doesn't matter what system you address when you approach it through its inherent simplicity. The results are always the same. 
a remarkable jump in performance, and the impression, this is just common sense, why haven't we done it before? 20 years ago, I demonstrated it on production systems or manufacturing plants in my book, The Goal. Then I demonstrated this approach on project-based systems in critical chain. The marketing and or strategy of companies is in it's not luck. And three years ago, I wrote on a whole industry in necessary but not sufficient. In each case, validation came from the results of the many companies that followed this approach. Still, most managers are oblivious to the concept of inherent simplicity. <coughs> and as a result, they're still looking for sophisticated and complex solutions. They still don't comprehend the magnitude of improvements that are within their reach. Do you have an answer? If you want to uh, summarize it in less than one and a half page, Almost everything else is trying to simplify the system. We are not trying to simplify the system. As a matter of fact, the whole idea of simplifying the system looks to me totally stupid. Why? Our system is so complex, we'll simplify it. So now it's not so complex, it's so complex. Big deal. We are not trying to simplify the system at all. What we are doing is acknowledging that in every system there is inherent simplicity. And what we are trying to do is to capitalize on it. In this sense, TOC is totally unique. Realizing that every system in the real world has inherent simplicity and providing the robust process of how to capitalize on the inherent simplicity. What is this process? Yes, the five steps. And if you have a problem in executing one of the five steps, then you have a toolkit called the thinking processes that enable you to do it. That's all. How do you like it? Hello. All right. By the way, in the last two days, I've mentioned Deming, a physicist, or oh no, a physicist, and so on and so forth. You see, in physics, nobody's talking about it, but that's the basic assumption of physics. That in this enormously complex world that we see around us, there is inherent simplicity. Look, for example, on something as complex as the movement of all bodies no matter if it is molecules or stars. Okay? What a complexity. Unbelievable. Came Newton, said there must be inherent simplicity, found three rules, and how simple it is. By the way, he did not invent these rules. They were, in reality, before Newton. Can you imagine it? And now everything is so simple. If you do not start with acknowledging, or at least believing, that there is inherent simplicity, you will never go and look for it. The beauty of TOC is that we took this same basic assumption of the hard sciences. Inherent simplicity exists. It's not trillion different things that are going on at the same time. There is something which is simple and guiding it all. Taking the same thing, and the thing that TOC have added is the process to capitalize. You see, the five steps do not exist in physics. <coughs> Amazingly enough, the thinking processes are not verbalized in physics. The process to capitalize it on this inherent simplicity. And this is theory, theory of constraints. <laughs>